Hey there, welcome back to the From the Logo podcast here on YouTube, sponsored by nobody yet. yet. No, we need to we need to get the what are the blue chews called? Um, the dick pills that are chewable for him. We need them as our sponsor, so we so I can be like Colton. Did you take my advice? <laughs> nope. <laughs> Uh yeah, summer league uh, game one over with. Actually, the first game and a half. Right now it's uh halftime. Blazers up 51-48 on the Philadelphia 76ers, or maybe they're the 66ers, this team. <laughs> Donovan Klingon, definitely the player to look out for. But uh, like you mentioned, Colton Ryan repair. Not looking half bad either. What's your uh, big takeaways uh, from let's let's go positive first. What are your positive takeaways? What players have been a nice positive surprise? I know everybody wants to talk about Klingon, and I'm all for it as well. So the first game, what I really took away is he's in the right place defensively a lot of the time, right? He doesn't have great lateral quickness and speed but he has like elite like positioning don't bury the lead colton you texted us and said this guy is the next hashim to beat no that was an exaggeration i did text that <laughs> but you but did say that i did say that that was more of a meme than anything. St so, stand behind your words man hey listen the offensive game did not look good but that's part of the summer league environment Right. I, I try not to overreact to one game. He was one for eight in that first game. The shots he did have that were kind of open, he rushed pretty bad. The threes were not good. I don't think that uh you said we start positive, right? Uh the the three point the we, we never start <laughs> positive on this. The the he's a shooter. What is there to be positive about? He's a projection, right? So he was not close on his three-point shots. It did not look like it was a finished product or even close. So he's going to have to work on his three-point shooting. But the defense looked pretty good. The rebounding, he had 13 rebounds and five blocks. So definitely was in there. You know, tonight he's already doubled his field goal. He's got – he's two for five at the half. I try to take into account the fact that the guards in summer league are not looking to get bigs the ball. And the Blazers don't have really a guard. Kennedy Chandler's not an NBA point guard. So they don't really have a guy getting clean in the ball in the spots that he needs to score. So I'm trying to take that all into account. His offense is not – he's not going to ISO and really break a guy down. His defenses look pretty good. My One of my biggest positive takeaways is actually just something you touched on a little bit, which is defense generally. I actually think that the Blazers defensively have looked better than the whole starting team looked last year in terms of their scheme. Um, I think that positioning has been pretty good. I mean, looking at the stats, like Klingon's offensive stats were not impressive, but he did have five blocks. Um, and we had uh, Mineo with four steals. Um, obviously, it's kind of a sloppy game generally, first game of Summer League, but I actually thought the defense didn't look half bad. Um, and so I'm hopeful that that's something that is a focus for the team, something they're focusing on in camp, something that continues to be a, a big point of emphasis for the team because defense was not our strength last year and neither was offense for that matter. But the offense hopefully will come. We need a decent defensive scheme from the get-go. Um, and it does seem like there's, there's something percolating there. Uh, so far, that seems to be holding fairly true in the first half of the second game, too. So that's my big positive takeaway is a little bit of defensive emphasis, a little bit of defensive intensity. Uh, hopefully the offense comes as well. I'm going to be honest with you guys. I haven't watched this. I can't watch summer league basketball. It's too painful. Plus, there's only, like you said, like we've talked about, only like four guys on the roster that are actually that we're looking at. And really, like, three of those guys are probably going to get minutes anyway. So, I I'm not watching this crap. But, uh, hey, go Klingon. <laughs> what, about what about Repair, though? What have you seen from Repair, Colton? Yeah, I mean, Repair started last game a little shaky. He had six turnovers in the game. But 
the second half, he was putting the ball in the basket. He's got such long arms. You know, he's fun to watch like that. Tonight, he came out aggressive on offense in the first half, in the first quarter, really. He started out with a quick nine points. Again, you got guys that aren't really going to be in the league, kind of as you put it, uh, taking some shots and going out there and shooting the ball. So it's it's hard to judge fully, but I've liked Repair's aggressiveness, and I've liked how he's looked as a as a whole just the movement the fluidity he looks he looks pretty interesting out there on the other side of the coin though chris murray as impressed as i've been with repair chris murray has been equally as disappointing uh he now has we're been going negative player. yes it, chris murray i feel like if he's the guy that you say if he had a shot he would be a good player but if he doesn't ever get the shot he, he's probably going to be out of the league so and his, right now, he does not look confident shooting. He's bricking kind of all over the rim, kind of just hoping it's going in at this point. So not promising with Chris Murray, which is sad because he's an older, young guy. I with mean, uh, Is it his twin? Is it, um, Keegan's his twin? Oh, yeah, that's, yeah, that's rough when you have your twin as a starter in the league too. Come on, just be Markeith. That's all we need from you. Yeah, I mean, for Summer League to even be worth talking about, we have to assume that there's something we can take away from it here. And so that's the same way I feel about Rupert. Um, You know, like my, like I said, with Klingon, hey, five blocks, maybe that's something that can get him feeling like I can block shots in the NBA. And, you know, hopefully that's something that translates. Same with Rupert. I don't know for sure that he's going to be able to score like that against actual NBA teams. Um, he did start to score pretty well, but it was also relatively inefficient uh the shot wasn't great you know he was like one for four which is pretty mediocre um and he did start to put the ball in the hoop from down low or from closer toward the end but i, I don't know that it was really enough of a sample to think that he's going to be able to do that in the nba but i'm going to try to keep the positivity that i had with Klingon and say that that's going to translate to or we at least gives them something to work on something to try in the nba um, and hopefully they'll both get some minutes where they can give it a real shot this season. Hmm. What was I? I don't even remember what I was going to say. I was looking up uh, to see if I can. Oh, yeah. I was just going to say, I don't hate these numbers from, from Donovan, honestly. This game, he looks, uh, just looking at the numbers, I, again, have not watched. Have not watched, wanted to make that clear. But four points, five rebounds, two blocks in the first half. I mean, if you double those stats up, you're looking at a close to a double double with, uh, you know, four or five blocks. It's not bad from a center. He's huge. Uh, one thing. One thing I want to say. He does look massive. That was the one thing I yeah. when I watched for a minute. Okay, I did watch for a minute. I'm going to admit that I did watch for a couple of minutes. He just looked enormous. That was the, definitely the takeaway. Is he looked like a big boy he does have an interesting game as far as passing goes with face up you know kind of outside the key top of the key type where he can eyeball everybody he's so much taller and he he was finding people with some great passes earlier in this game and he just had another one because i am watching as we what, pod on the what side. are you on what are you on oh i am on it's called one stream one stream like uh one stream oh the number, the number one the number one oh number one stream number one one stream and, uh, of them all dot vip stream. you're gonna make me reveal my i need to check i don't know some unsavory advertisements are gonna start popping up if i go one on stream website. dot dot eu one stream dot eu yeah. European. The, so we're out here in the cable cutter, the co the cord cutting world, right? I mean, oh, this I is pretty nice. Yeah, it's not bad. Not bad. Not bad. You gotta close a couple ads, just yeah. So, but you know, um, does your yeah, uh, so, does your ad blocker like take care of those? Or yeah, I mean, on my phone, not. But if I were to watch it on this, yeah. Uh, but Klingon back to Klingon, just you know, that was our sponsor stream one stream, here. yeah. One stream, <laughs> welcome to the From the Logo podcast, sponsored oh. by One Stream. 
Um, but Klingon really, he, he's got some good passing chops. I hope if, if he was, let's say he was abusive Nurkic baseline with better rim protection and a little bit more efficient score, we would all take that, I think. Because those those are the major flaws at the end. He just got an offensive foul. He looked aggressive though, man. He was posting up, and it was an aggressive post up. When you were talking about Nurkic, and I was watching this post up, I'm like, I have never seen Nurk post like that before. Calling for the ball, yeah, yeah. Riley, he was the guy. Yeah, I haven't seen that from a Blazers big man since Greg Oden. Yeah, for real. Like Trigger a guy Oden. who a guy who actually wants to get into the post and uh, get have the ball in the post too. Yeah. As Charles Barkley says, when a guy's banging you, you got to spin up. <laughs> when he's we just would... banging and banging. Kirby is on Kirby is on one today. He is he is a legendary figure today. I I do want to mention cuz this is something that we talked about with the draft. Buzelis my guy, he had a big game yesterday. Oh, clean with a huge poster dunk. <laughs> nice. <laughs> oh, you're actually a little bit ahead of me. Oh, that was a big one, right? Uh, not bad. Donnie, Donovan, um, Puzelis had 28 points last night, and he looked really good out there. Uh, I really hope Klingon, you know, this, this is all summer league, so you don't know what you can take from it, but – he had a big poster as well. He was hitting step back threes. He was rebounding. He was running the floor, <laughs> hitting mid range. So, yeah, great. I like when Donovan Klingon just got posterized back. So they're trading. <laughs> they're trading shots. You're, you're spoiling everything. <laughs> you're Speaking of guys who are going off, though, the goat Zach Eady had what like four, fifteen and fifteen with five blocks in his first game. And yeah. I think I read he's the betting favorite, like the um, consensus betting favorite for rookie of the year at this point. It's pretty, pretty early still, but yeah, I mean, I think he does, he does look pretty good. I, maybe our dad was onto <laughs> something there. He he liked him from the beginning, but I mean, if he can look anything like he looked in college, obviously he's going to be a total stud. He's a two time player of the year. So yeah, I would like to see how he does keeping guards in front of them that are like NBA guards, like De'Aaron Fox, <laughs> De'Aaron Fox is a bonus pick and roll. If he can defend that. Can anybody defend that? Well, maybe the Blazers should have picked Paul. Well, I'm just saying like faster guards, you know, like is he going to be able to stay on the floor? It looks like Klingon, even though he's slower, has good positioning that he can at least stay in front of people. But can he, if Edie can do that, I could have been, you know, wrong, and you sh Blazers should have taken him at seven. He should have went number one overall. The traditional big. I mean, he's gonna be like, that? he's gonna be like Hakeem out there. Your dad was could have been right. We'll see. Somebody they should so fire awesome. Mike Schmidt and replace him with my dad for the draft. Oh man, expert. that would be. We should do an episode where your dad gives us the lineup that he wants. I want to hear it because I want to hear his opinions on this he would never come on but it would be i feel like he would be the best guest to have on just because you guys could go at it just, but he just would, the, the issue is is that he would not debate these these topics like on the podcast he would just go like quiet probably and just not just give us his list just ask him for his list All right. let's talk about your dad's players to watch i'll get my dad's we'll do a we'll do a dad episode where we get info from our dads and hear what players they would watch that should be our next video actually i think too bad we missed father's day that yeah, yeah. Father's day. There, we've talked about that for a while getting the dads on but our dad's not coming on but we can try to get him by uh by proxy to come on just get all of the talking points that he would say and i'll be like his voice he's like games should be 75 to 74 and everybody should be posting up no shooting threes. Am I right? Am I close? No. No. <laughs> That's definitely not his style, but <laughs> he doesn't oh. like Jody. That's for sure. He misses when Paul Allen was the owner because he was a good owner. He would go into the luxury tax to keep a good team. Well, 
I think that the Blazers in the future, we'll see what happens with the sale. But hopefully by the time the Blazers are wanting to go in the luxury tax for whatever reason, they have an owner who's going to support that. And I don't know who it's going to be. Phil Knight's getting up there, but hopefully it's somebody that'll do it because, geez. I will say, based on our conversation last week, I still am feeling pretty good about the the draft pick that we did make because if we had gotten Buzelis, um, it would have made a little bit less sense given that we went out and got Advia and also given what next year's draft looks like. We talked a lot in the last video, go watch it if you haven't, but about how stacked next year's draft is for wings. And so if we didn't have a center of the future and we'd gone out and got someone like Buzelis, I mean, maybe it would be really exciting in summer league, um, but I'm hopeful that if Klingon can turn into a serious starting center, even if he's not the best player out of the draft, even if he's not the star player out of the draft, that it'll still make sense because we can get someone else to fill that position next year. Um, in addition to having picked up Advia and then have someone who can anchor moving forward because I'm still, as you all know, I don't think DeAndre Ayton is going to be our center, our post player of the future. Um, maybe he can maybe he can start shooting some shots this year. We've talked about that too. But I do not think that he wants to be down low. We needed somebody who's okay playing down low, and I'm glad we got him. Wow, that's breaking news. You don't think... DeAndre is going to be the center, the down low center of the future. Right. What is, if uh, looking at the Blazers roster right now, I was thinking about this the other day with the, the Olympics coming on. I was uh, imagining that if what came to mind originally was that if Shaden Sharp can ever stay healthy and develop into the skill set that it seems like he could develop into, he would be playing for Team Canada. Is there anybody on the Blazers roster you could see playing for Team USA one day? That'd be kind of fun to have uh, two different teams to be looking out for. You know, if like Scoot was on Team USA and Shaden was on Team Canada, you'd kind of be able to watch both of them. And all then also uh, with Team US USA, it's so deep that no one really gets to shine but with like team canada if shaden was this you'd probably start for him he, he could you know he has the potential to play alongside sga and jamal murray and dylan brooks dylan brooks who else there's another there was another stud on the team canada too um toronto raptors player now rj barrett yeah, RJ Barrett. Like, I don't think that's who I was thinking of. I said stud. Wow, the hate for RJ. Yeah, that'll be interesting to see what happens. I, I think what another thing that's cool that I was gonna say, and I totally spaced it. A lot of the Blazers' young guys and Denny were down there in Vegas, and I think they're there tonight supporting Donovan and all the other guys out there. They all made the trip down to Vegas. Um, and they're all sitting together. So I think it's awesome that Denny's already kind of acclimating with the guys and getting some chemistry going. I don't know. There's probably runs down there that they got going at all times in Vegas where there's ball going at all times. So I think it's a good idea for them all to be down there and hanging out and just building the chemistry. So. Yeah, we've seen that. Those uh, hot starts in the past come when the team kind of spends the summer together. Dame was pretty good at orchestrating some of those team building activities um, during the off season. I wonder who the sort of ringleader is on the Blazers right now. That's going to be an interesting thing to watch out for the next couple seasons. Who's going to really step into that role as uh, the alpha on the court, obviously, but then also the the guy that kind of keeps everyone connected off the court. The guy kind of plans that sort of stuff. The uh, locker room leader, as it were. So you guys, I'm going to pose this to you guys. Because you guys are the big, you guys are the big Donovan believers before the draft, right? Do you think Donovan can be that? Is he the vocal guy to rally? That's what I'm hoping for. In a couple years, right? It, because he's he definitely looks like he could potentially be an anchor of a defense, but is he the guy? Because you know, Shaden's quiet, Scoots 
passionate, but not doesn't seem too raw rawy, right? So do you think Donovan's the guy that's kind of like the enforcer, but also the guy or what? I think best case scenario, that's a fact, you know, if that that's uh could potentially turn out to be one of his biggest skill sets is kind of being able to rally the team around him and be the locker room guy just because he's won so much. Um, you got to imagine he took something from those winning cultures and uh, hopefully he'll bring it to the Blazers. Yeah. What I saw from Donovan was a lot of maturity um, in his interviews, in all of his preseason stuff, his pressers with the team, even in practice, he seems like the kind of guy who's coming in with that mentality and he doesn't have a whole lot of competition for that role either. Um, you know, we saw that kind of happen with, with Dame when Dame came in and he kind of had to assert himself a little bit as the, as the leader of the locker room. And at this point, I feel like it wouldn't be too terribly hard to come in and assert yourself as the leader of the locker room might meet a little resistance from someone like Ant, but I mean, how long is he going to be there? I don't know. Um, you know, just that, even, even Anthony doesn't seem like a very vocal leader, you know, or at least it doesn't come naturally to him. What I remember hearing about him last year is that he'd done a pretty good job building that skill set over the last few years, trying to be more vocal and stuff. But I don't think it's something that comes very naturally to him, to Shaden. Scoot, we'll see. I, I don't know. Scoot could end up having like the Kobe mentality. It's hard to hard to tell. That's what I saw from him originally when the Blazers drafted him last year I'm like oh this guy's like a killer he's gonna go out there and you know be the trash talking like Anthony Edwards type of young gun um, but I don't really know if I saw too much of that but he had such a you know had such an up and down rookie season maybe this year we'll really start to see what his personality is I've been <laughs> I've been pretty vocal about this but you know I think that Scoot I think his rookie season was horrible for a lot of reasons. Like I'm not just talking about statistically or anything like that. Like it was disappointing statistically and he didn't play enough games and he didn't play enough minutes, but just as a culture, the fact that the team was in such disarray, all of the various injuries, the fact that he didn't get to play with the guys he's going to hopefully be building a team with over the years. I think that was a terrible first year for him and kind of what we're hearing now you know, some guys are trying to take the optimistic spin, some of the coaching staff and say like, this is, that's what he needed. He needed a year of adversity in order to kind of, you know, maybe reading between the lines, maybe kind of humble him a little bit or just kind of let him know what he's going to save the coaches into. jobs. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, I, you know, I think that there is some hope that the second year is going to be a very different year for Scoot that he is going to have the talent to become a star player. You know, when you were talking about him being on a, on an Olympic team, it's like nothing that we saw last year would give me any indication that he's going to be an Olympic team guy in the future. But there is some hope that he has that seed in it, you know, down deep somewhere and that that's going to get watered this year. So this year will tell a lot about, I think, I think what his career is going to look like both as a leader of a team, as the guy for the team, which is why we drafted him. And, you know, just his overall NBA future and, and future in basketball, too. All that's got to happen is me and Colton got to go to every game and then he'll shoot six for six from three and look like a completely unstoppable force of nature. But uh game's got to come to town every game. <laughs> that One thing you can say about Scoot, though, and here's why I'm not as worried about him or anything, really. He lives in the gym. You can tell. I mean, he's shredded. The, we've seen a couple workout videos from him this year. The workout videos, right, whatever. Ben Simmons does workout videos. Who cares? But the end of the second video, I was seeing left-hand finishes. That's one of the key things for, that he needs to work on. And last season, he closed really strong. I know didn't feel that way just because the team was, like you said, in disarray. But you go down, you go down the line – and I believe he was second or third in the last like 20 games of the season for potential assists. And he was, he was diamond it. He was, and he was scoring more efficiently. The only guy that was ahead of him on potential assists in that time frame was Jokic. I mean, and with the guys he was playing with, not a lot of them are even NBA players or, you know, who their name even anymore. That's a, that's a promising thing. You can, he has talent. You're right. I think he came in and, 
it was a very, very, very rough start. It was just bad. The first 12 games were just – couldn't even watch it because it just hurt as a Blazer fan. But he did close the year strong. And if he comes in and works out this offseason and, you know, even if it doesn't lead to wins this next season, if he's out there showcasing himself, we're going to feel a lot better about the rebuild, all of us. That's the key thing. Shaden and Scoot playing together, Scoot showing what he can do, maybe building some chemistry with Klingon now, right? Pick and roll. Scoot's going to be able to find Klingon. Getting Anthony off the roster. Yeah, that's just going to have to happen. People are just going to have to accept that. That's It's going to have to happen eventually. If not this season, the next – this is it. This is the last year of Anthony, unless something happens and he just somehow in his seventh season – becomes that winning successful player. I just don't Steph see Steph Curry year. Blazers go seven have 70 wins and win the championship. <laughs> yeah. I mean look, we we basically let Dame walk over choosing Scoot over Dame. Why would we choose Anthony Simons over Scoot? That doesn't make any sense. So it's it's time to move on. If we have to commit to Scoot and Shaden, it's come on. We let Dame go, top seventy five player all time, because we wanted to draft Scoot. Do not let Anthony Simons get in the way of developing that team. I think that's simplifying things a little bit, but I get what you're saying as far as as far as uh, choosing Scoot over Dame. Like that's there's a little bit more to that situation than that, but. I, I feel like they might have saw it that way, though. Who did? I, mean, I feel like he they probably said, dude, you drafted my replacement. Well, he was he was using every excuse he could to to come up with a reason to get out because he'd been. Yeah, he'd be he'd been shoehorning himself into being a blazer for life for the last 15, you know, 20, 10 well, we years. Talked about, we talked about this, though. If if the pick was Wemby, Dame was staying. That was what we all said. If it was Brandon Miller, he still might have stayed. I don't know, but but the Blazers didn't have a choice in either one of those people. I, I know, but I'm just who saying, are they going to? Who was number four in the draft? Like, and, then, and then Thompson, right? And you know he yeah. had solid. He had some flash, but he had a. I he think couldn't he had a better rookie year than Scoot. You it think if they would have drafted Thompson, Dame would have stayed? No, no. Yeah, no. that's the thing. He was out of. He was out the door any which way at that t- at that time period by that point he was gone i mean he'd been gone unless Wemby was the yeah, one yeah unless some miracle fell into the blazers lap into his lap in particular but... the alternate timeline where the blazers get Wemby is similar to the, one of those other alternate timelines with the blazers that they had roy aldridge odin they had you know all the other what if blazers scenarios those are always fun to think about what's your favorite one what I do mean, you, do you like Damon Wimby better than Roy Aldridge and Odin? No, here, here's no Roy Aldridge and Odin is just like the dream. What that we were all alive. What for. about Clyde and, MJ? And what about uh, Sabonis coming over when he was in his prime and uh, just destroying the league and winning over? Basically, Michael looking Clinton. like Joker, 25, 30 years yes, ago, hundred percent with with two knees that works right and in shape. That one's an underrated one. Jordan and Clyde. What if they won the coin flip? That was Hakeem Elijah one because you know the Blazers had to flip the coin and they ended up second. They would have taken Hakeem Elijah one and paired him with his college teammate Clyde. That would have been crazy. What they ended they- up winning I- chips together and then in the nineties in Houston, right? Yeah. What What if they ended up picking Charles Barkley instead of you know Bowie? What if there's so many? There's, there's... You don't you can't you don't even remember his name. Sam Bowie? No, I remember his name. It's, it's Bowie, isn't it? It's, it's, it's Bowie, Bowie, potato, <laughs> potato. Come on, you gotta know. He's a the, he's the biggest Blazers legend of all time. You gotta come know his on, name. man. Come on, come on, yeah. man. There's just too many. There's too many. What if the Blazers instead of drafting? legend who i actually was a big fan of martel webster oh and trade back and just pick chris paul oh what about that i, I mean, mean i don't i don't think that would have we definitely wouldn't have a championship that's for sure what if the blazer i'm gonna keep going what if the blazers had roy and aldridge and instead of odin being healthy they picked durant i mean roy aldridge and durant and roy 
you know, his knees were fine. I don't know. Like, how many do we want to go? I could keep going. What's the best one? What's out of all those? What's the best team? The one that the best team. Okay, let me ask you this. MJ and Clyde is pretty hard to. MJ and Clyde's hard to beat, but the one we were most excited about, Kirby. You and I were talk. We, we talked about this one time. We were at a certain school playing basketball when we were a certain age, and we were talking about Roy Aldridge and Odin and doing the what if. That was after the Blazers drafted Odin before he was playing. Well, he he had showed some stuff, but we oh were no, to see what it would look like, and so sad. That one we were hyped on. I mean, come on, winning the number one pick. I literally was screaming, jumping up and down with my dad when that when they won the number one pick. So let me ask you. That was another one. Do you do you happen to remember what the odds were for the Blazers that year? Because they had the seventh pick. Yeah, that goes. And to it was higher, harder odds. It was like six percent or something that's like the hawks this year i know the hawks was even higher uh or lower odds but uh that just goes to show that like the tanking thing it's almost better to because you think about the teams that get that number one pick and they get lucky like that they already have some foundation in place they're not like dog shit detroit pistons scenario you know like how much is the number one pick even gonna they get Cade cunningham and then just like basically fumble him because they have nothing else in place that's why it's all development though develop the guys trade the vets still you can still do both develop your core like i get what you're saying but for a guy like cooper flag okay let's see your what would your guys' reactions be if they got cooper flag i mean at this point with how hyped he is right now i mean it'd be like pandemonium in this podcast we'd be we'd be going nuts about it we'd have Six episodes in a row analyzing Cooper Flag high school mix, you know, like I just it's worth it. It's worth it to put give I would be I would be more excited about getting Cooper Flag if the Blazers won like 30 to 35 games and looked like they had a real foundation with Scoot and Shaden and stuff rather than looking like the Detroit Pistons and getting Cooper Flag. That's all I'm saying with that. I know that obviously you want to play the odds, but occasionally and you know. I want to know, like, uh, look at a study or something that how often the worst team gets the number one pick because it doesn't feel like it happens very often. That's why they flatten the odds, though. Yeah, I like, can give yourself tied. I Honestly, mean, we, we, me and Riley talked about this recently. How much we hate tanking and how much, like, I don't. I think it would be. I know I could. I already know Colton's going to disagree with this. I think I've heard him disagree with it before. But I don't hate the idea of like flattening the odds even more, like making maybe the worst 10 teams or something like that all have the same odds. I just hate the idea of that that race to the bottom. And uh, if if like thing to get rid of tanking, I am in favor of. I think that that is cancer for the league. Cancer. It just makes the whole end of the season really, it just turns it into a shit show because like half the teams aren't trying. Half the teams are, or you know, a third of the teams are actively trying to lose. Another third are resting players, and then the other third is like stuck in the middle. It's just that's why I love the first. One of the reasons I love the first round of the playoffs so much is because it's a breath of fresh air. You actually get to see competitive basketball for the first time in like a month because the whole last month of the season is just a big tanking disaster. Yeah, but there's no real good solution because. If you have the bottom teams, 10 teams making it, I mean, it's different this year's draft when the Hawks get it. But what about this? What about the Lakers miss the playoffs and they have the same odds as the Detroit Pistons and they add Cooper Flag to LeBron and Anthony Davis? Then you're I think like, that would be that would be exciting though. That would add bringing in a a number 1 player like that into an already good team. Like that would be it definitely wouldn't be fair or whatever the the parody that they're trying to get in the league, but it would be exciting to see like some stud go to a team where they're not quite good enough, but like this guy, maybe you could push him over the top. He could be like the Magic Johnson and start a dynasty. I would take that all day over sending another potentially great player to toil away in the gulag of Detroit. <laughs> <laughs> 
because it's it's gotta stop detroit can't keep doing this i know why should teams be rewarded for being such a shitty franchise like that's another I mean, thing how, how are they ever gonna get better you might as well relegate them yeah that's what i'm saying bring in a relegation system that would it, at least inspire them to try to be competitive like it's just ridiculous they're trying they just can't figure it are out they, is detroit trying colton they're trying i think they signed tobias harris right Tobias Harris over me, I think. Yeah, maybe they need to. Uh, maybe they need to go down to the what is it called? I don't even the. What's the Wrexham League called? The <laughs> National League or something. <laughs> something like that. Yeah, Pistons need to go to the National League. All right, guys, we're out of time. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next week. Bye bye.